Well, welcome everybody. And we're just going to wait a few minutes to allow the participants to sign in and we'll get started shortly. Thank you. All right, well, let's get started. A, a number of participants have already signed in and we're very excited to uh, have our grand finale of the NSOAP manual uh, online series. And uh, we are very excited to have a, a great lineup today of speakers. And today's um, topic is adopting a pragmatic lens, the simple steps for translating the NSOAP policy into action. And uh, I just want to give you a warm welcome from the United Nations Institute for Training and Research and the Global Surgery Foundation. And uh, also give a thank you to our sponsors, Operation Smile and G4 Alliance. Uh, we have some of their representatives who will be uh, giving a, a note of address. And also, of course, the program on Global Surgery and Social Change. And this whole series uh, is made uh, possible with the support of Johnson & Johnson. So I just wanna recognize them in this uh, educational series. So um, I'll turn it over now to Dr. Scott Corlew of uh, the program on Global Surgery Social Change at the Harvard Medical School, and then we'll go from there. So Scott, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. And thanks to everyone for attending. I hope that many of you have had the opportunity to attend the entire series. This, as Jeff said, has been a joint effort of UNITAR and the PGSSC of Harvard Medical School, focusing on the concept of national surgical obstetric and anesthesia plans. This concept, of course, was an outgrowth of the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery and is arguably the best framework for countries to develop appropriate surgical care within national health plans. This webinar series has covered key aspects of this framework, including NSOAPs and pandemic response, the donor perspectives on funding of surgical care, customization of the framework to individual and country needs, uh, the role of NGOs, academic institutions, and professional associations in surgical care on a national scale, and today, moving forward uh, with the pragmatic lens. So UNITAR and PGSSC are honored to have the sponsorship of the G4 Alliance and Operation Smile today, and privileged to have today's webinar moderated by Dr. Lori Romanzi of the PGSSC. So Lori, all yours. Thank you, Scott. I would like to again also thank our sponsors and get right into it by introducing our panel. We have with us a robust group, some of whom have had the opportunity to participate in uh, prior webinars. Um, I'd like to give Dr. Kate Tulenko an opportunity to make an opening statement on behalf of Operation Smile. Kate, go ahead. Thank you so much, Lori. So hello, I'm Dr. Kate Talenko, a senior education consultant with Operation Smile. For almost 40 years, Operation Smile has increased the capacity for essential surgery in developing countries through the lens of cleft care. And we'll, we're thrilled to be a co-sponsor of the webinar today. Operation Smile is helping to implement a pilot program for the Madagascar ENSO, which you will hear about today from Dr. Lala. We have also helped the Ministry of Health in Vietnam to develop and implement national standards for safe surgery, which include safe surgery checklists and which will affect up to 3 million patients a year. Throughout its almost 40 years, Operation Smile has been making improvements at the hospital level. This includes during the COVID-19 pandemic, during which Operation Smile has helped with equipment and with knowledge dissemination. As we prepare for the next 40 years of service, we're rolling out a 40 for 40 plan to increase essential surgery capacity in 40 district hospitals around the world in order to bring essential surgery to 1 million patients. Operation Smile will launch its University Without Walls to expand its training of the essential surgery team, including surgeons, nurses, and biomedical techs. We know that in order to retain surgical teams in underserved hospitals, we must train them in those hospitals rather than in quaternary hospitals in the capital city. 
Operation Small is always working to expand its team of volunteers and partners, and we hope that you will join us in our vision to ensure that all children have access to essential surgery. Thank you. And now uh, I'd also like to have Ruben Ayala speak, please, on behalf of the G4 Alliance, where he is the president of the Permanent Council and also serves as chief medical officer of Operation Smile. Ruben. Good day, everyone. It really is a pleasure to, on behalf of the, G the Global Alliance for Surgical Obstetric Trauma and Anesthesia Care, uh, to welcome you and to thank you for taking the time to join us today. The G4 Alliance is committed to advocating for the, ne advocating for the neglected surgical patient. We bring together voices, uh, our voices and work towards increased access to safe, essential, time and timely surgical obstetric trauma and anesthesia care as part of universal health coverage. The more than 60 member organizations of the G4 Alliance represent academic institutions, but professional societies, social enterprises, nonprofits, and entities from the public and private sector. Uh, while our advocacy work seeks to increase global political priority for surgical obstetrics, trauma, and anesthesia care, each organization of the Alliance works every day in the implementation of programs, initiatives, and the mobilization of resources to help provide access to safe surgical care for patients in need in over 160 countries. We believe that safe surgery is a human right, that surgical care saves lives and prevents disability, that surgical care is cross-cutting and contributes to this health system, that it's required to fulfill the promise of universal coverage, that is cost-effective and it benefits economies of countries, and that the lack of surgical care uh, has a deleterious effect on, on families. So we are committed uh, to this cause and, and thrilled and appreciative of the opportunity to join UNITAR, the Global Surgery Foundation, um, Harvard's PGSSC, Operation SMILE, uh, and, and others in this forum. And we also wish to acknowledge Johnson & Johnson for their support to the entire series. We hope this session will offer tangibles as we seek to transfer policy into action and real opportunities for health, for health and improvement in the, in, the, in the condition of human lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruben. And now I'd like to introduce our other panelists. We have Dr. Emmanuel Macasa, founding director of the WIT Center of Surgical Care for Primary Health and Sustainable Development at the University of Witts Watersrand in Johannesburg. We have Dr. Bisola Onajem Obembe, Secretary to the Permanent Council of the G4 Alliance and the recent past president of the Nigerian Society of Anesthetists and a board member of the World Federation of the Society of Anesthesiologists. We also have with us Dr. Bhagawan Korala, joining us from Nepal, professor and head, cardiothoracic, professor and head of the Cardiothoracic and Vascular Surgery Division at Tribhuvan University in Kathmandu, Nepal, and the chairman of the Nepal Medical Society. We have also from Madagascar, Dr. Mama Lalatiana, who is the former Minister of Health and the Dean of the Medical School of An Anantarivo. And we also have with us Prof. Pankaj Jani, the Vice President, President-elect to the Permanent Council of the G4 Alliance, and the former Secretary General of the College of Surgeons of East, Central, and Southern Africa. So among our learning objectives for today, we hope to navigate and better understand in this final webinar where we are, where we've been, and mostly where we're going and how, we're, how we are in the process of getting there in terms of formulating NSOAP at the national level, and then all of the many translations of NSOAP as it leaves and becomes smaller policies, even down to the level of hospital and other facility protocols directly affecting patient care. So I'd like to invite Dr. Mikasa to speak about some of his work in navigating that arc, or let's call it a rainbow from actually creating NSOAP to actually translating NSOAP into practice. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction and thank you uh, everybody who's been involved in putting together the webinar series and I salute all the panelists and everybody attending today. Um, 
I am sure, I hope you can hear me. Um, so I've been involved with uh, issues to do with the ENSOP, um, starting from the, the last meeting of the Lancet Commission on, on Global Surgery that took place in, in Italy, in Bellagio. And um, at that time, we were formulating the resolution at the WHO. And so I had the honor to attend that meeting. And then the Lancet Commission was also finalizing its work. And now, as you know, a resolution at the UN, indeed, even the, the outcomes of the Lancet Commission needed action. There was a lot of things that were highlighted in the report, uh, a lot of lessons, and also a framework that was developed on how um, what was learned could be translated into something tangible. While at the UN or at WHO, the countries were committing together with their partners to the same cause. So it was a matter of putting the two together. And so I had the opportunity being a representative of government to uh, see this opportunity. And of course, we wanted to try and see if we could solve our challenges at country level using that. So we went through with the resolution of the same in the same year. And then of course we had the framework and uh, the commissioners were kind enough to say they would be willing to help us. And uh, PGSSC was very willing to send us fellows because we didn't know how to do it at country level. The other thing that I should say was that for us, it was a matter of luck because there was a lot of alignment at the time because my minister wanted this to be done. Our controlling officer in the ministry, the permanent secretary wanted this to be done. The director responsible for clinical care in the country wanted this to be done. And me, the diplomat representing them in Geneva wanted this to be done. So there was a lot of alignment and that's why somehow we moved very, very fast. Other countries may not be as lucky as we were uh, to have that alignment because to create the policy again, it needs a lot of buy-in and leadership from the central government or the Ministry of Health. And I know in the work that we've continued to do on the issue of developing the ENSOP in SADAC, uh, again, we got the resolution at WHO and we've got other resolutions at regional level where we've tried to bring all the 16 member states of SADAC to try and work together because uh, we have different expertise and opportunities. So we want to share our best practice and also move as a region because we can solve problems in Zambia and then there are problems in Zimbabwe and things like that. But to translate any of those political commitments into something that's a national policy, it takes leadership from the central government. And I know that many of you are having those challenges. Uh, this would need a lot of advocacy and you, you have to advocate first of all within our, yourselves as, as uh, entities that are interested. And it doesn't need to be a dip, you don't need to be a diplomat, you could be a professional, uh, you could just be somebody working uh, in, a, in, in a private sector or indeed just a private individual, but it needs you to have the evidence of some sort of what's happening. And also you have to try and sell this to the policymakers because as you know, there are a lot of priorities. Already now we have a lot of other things that are going on, COVID-19 is going on, but you have to show the relevance of how uh, the new policy could be framed, uh, how much it may cost, and also how useful it's going to be to continue to solve the problems at country level. And there are many issues that can be used to, to lobby. Uh, issues of maternal mortality or maternal health and children's health are very, very key and very good to use, but there are other things, emergency preparedness and response, as you can see in the current ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the care of those that are severely ill involves things that we use in surgical teams. So even during this pandemic, there's a lot of opportunity that can be used to push this agenda to ensure that it can come through. And in terms of capacity or know-how, how to do it, now that we've worked on this agenda in many, many parts of the world, we have a lot of experience and we have a lot of partners that can easily come to support you in making sure that the policy is well drafted, but still leadership has to come from within. Um, I also have been involved to try and see how we can translate where we've already created the policy. How do we mm -hmm. translate that into a program? Because again, you may develop a policy, which is a national surgical obstetric anesthesia plan. But if that is not translated into services that touch the people, then it's as useless as a resolution at WHO, which remains at WHO. So mm -hmm. that again has been challenging and there's no country that has really worked out how to do it. And also because most of the programs can only be developed, or at least in our low middle income countries, again, most of our programs are financed by someone. 60% of our health budget is usually financed by external partners who have their own areas of interest of what they want to finance. Um, and you know, even in WHO, most of the budget is earmarked funding that actually goes to specific interests. So we have struggled at global level, at regional level to have a lot of funds that can help us 
build a program very quickly. So we have had to adjust and see how we can pick the pieces and see how we can find a lot of entry points. And I know that this webinar series covered a lot of that uh, issues of how to find entry points. So I'll just mention that for us in Zambia um, and in Sadiq generally, one of the entry points we're looking at is already this COVID-19. We are, it's a great challenge, but it's also, like I said, a great opportunity where we can showcase the impact of improved uh, surgical healthcare, the anesthesia equipment, the, the critical care people, the pulse oximeters, everything that's being used in the COVID-19, including the face mask, the surgical masks to prevent COVID-19. Those are surgical tools. So right. we are trying to showcase how much uh, improving capacity in surgical health services can help sustain or deliver good results in other parts. And in the near future, we're going to try and focus more on maternal mortality because it, here in Zambia, it was already declared an emergency. And as you know, maternal mortality is mostly caused by bleeding or hemorrhage and bleeding mostly can only be prevented by surgical interventions. Uh, and so we want to address the challenge that the country is facing and see if we can use that as an entry point. And we have to go piece by piece. I don't think we have been able to create a total program, but we, I know that only through entry points can we really get to where we can be and we can build slowly. And also I want to emphasize the need to showcase the impact. If we can improve surgical services in one district, what is the impact on health system strengthening? What's the impact on health outcomes? And of course, what's the impact on the social development of the people? Those are key things that we have to show. Those are the things that to create buy-in. And indeed, those are the things that can help others join us so that we can even move faster. Moderator, maybe I'll stop here and I can, I'm happy to clarify and give more details. Thanks. Thank you, Emmanuel. You have a vast experience, but also you beautifully highlighted the reason that we should have a follow-on to this series to speak to uh, Jeff's uh, point earlier on in the introductions. And you brought up uh, many things that I think we'll be touching on again, and one that's very dear to my heart, which is this interface between the maternal newborn and reproductive health or uh, world at the policy level, the OBGYN department and midwifery departments at the at the facility level. But I'd like to turn now uh, to go to the opposite end of the spectrum uh, in it, in this region of Africa and ask Prof Lala if he would speak to us about where they are in the arc and and which ends of the arc have they used and and we've heard a lot about champions and points of entry and synergies between the two eventually in order to be sustainable, there are always champions for everything that needs to be done and everything that works well, but to be sustainable, it has to become the environment that we're working in. So Prof Lala, could you please share your experiences in Madagascar? I think you're muted. You should try unmuting. You're Thank you. Do you hear me? Yes, we hear it's you. Okay, now. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Hello, everyone. So I'm very happy to to participate on this uh, meeting, and uh, uh, the title of uh, this meeting is very important for me: Ad adopting a pragmatic lens, simple steps for translating and swap policy into action. And I would like to share with you the experiences of Madagascar and the story about uh, NSOAP in Madagascar. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to introduce myself. I was Minister of Health on um, 2015 to 2019. So for uh, four years, four, five years, I was Minister of Health. And uh, before, before I was Minister of Health, I was Dean of Medical School. The problem in Madagascar, is that Madagascar is a very big country, very big island. And the many districts in Madagascar, many regions in Madagascar, they have no medical center, no surgical center. And sometimes they, they use plane to go to another place to, to receive the surgery, for example. And they, they must pay very, 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 very high price. And, uh, uh, we have to resolve uh, this uh, problem in my country. So uh, in, in 2016, I would like to, to, uh, to share with you now, in May, on May 2016, 
I was in uh, Dubai for the initiative to develop the MSWAP organized by Operation Smell. And there I received, uh, I was the Minister of Health there. Huh? I received some, uh, some information. And after that, we, we, we began our first meeting on September of 2016, our first meeting how to, to develop strategic in the NSWAP. And on March 2017, we, with uh, all stakeholders, private, public, private, NGOs, we, we, was, we organized the first meeting about NSWAP. And uh, on May 2019, we validate, validate by large committee, the NSWAP in Madagascar. It, I talked about you, I talked about you, about the strategic policy, but I will continue to the, the pragmatic action, no. So, and I was on Madagascar before, we, we had uh, yet a national plan for surgery, but just the theories, no, no action, no practice, practice. So when I was Minister of Health, I, I begin firstly to, to see the region. I did for one year, 30,000 kilometers by car. I saw every region in Madagascar and I, I saw the real problem for the people. No, no surgical center, no, no, no hospital, no surgeon. So, I, uh, I, we, we began to, 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 to create infrastructure, to build infrastructure and equipment for hospitals. We built around 40, 50 hospitals, new hospitals. It's the first step. And after that, we began and to, to, to train doctors, providers from district region, regions, Mm -hmm. uh, so from uh, difficult access, they give in they gave in the capital in Antananarivo training for two years for surgeon the the doctor practitioner for anesthetist obstetrician just for two years and after that they will return to the areas for the district uh, region and they uh, practice. There. So could so, I ask you, Prof. Lala, could I interrupt you for a minute? How has the ENSOP framework either helped or perhaps even put up stumbling blocks in the process that you're developing? Has ENSOP been okay. a positive tool? Uh, has it been a galvanizing tool? Um, or has it uh, been something that you've just been trying to unpack while you're trying to get the work done as best, as best you can? So we bought the fund. Funding. Has, has ENSO been helpful to you in this process? And if so, yes. could you, could you yes. uh, share that with us? No, no, I, I, am, I, I can say that uh, ENSO up helped very well uh, the program in Madagascar. And uh, af after the, the meeting in 2016, we, we changed. And mm. as, uh, as technocrat, as technocrat, my advantage is that I, I am technocrat because in some, many, many countries, Minister of Health are not technocrat. And, and so they have policy, many, many policies, many strategic, but no actions. And uh, as technocrat, I practice, I, I give action, immediately action. And uh, I think that NSWAP helped uh, well my, as technician, my determination to, to change health system in Madagascar. Thank you. Yes, I know you shared with us that the majority of people, I think you said either 60 or 80% of people live outside of urban centers in Madagascar, which is unusual um, across the mm -hmm. continent. So that gives you a particular challenges. I'd like to move on now and talk about the role of regional professional organizations. We have in the EXA region, the College of Surgeons of East Central and Southern Africa. And so I'd like to call on Prof. Pankaj Jani to talk about 
Cosexa's utilization of NSOAP role in <clears throat> galvanizing NSOAP uh, and, and opportunities and challenges assessment of where Cosexa is with NSOAP and also within your, your extensive role in Kenya. How is NSOAP um, helpful? How is NSOAP uh, presenting challenges, etc.? Please, Prof. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lori. Uh, good evening to all the panelists and thank you for this huge honor. Uh, I am based in Nairobi. Uh, my name is Pankaj Jani and I am with the Department of Surgery at the University of Nairobi. I was the past president of COSEXA. Uh, the president of COSEXA last year, I stepped down in uh, 2020 and uh, we have an organization now, OTPAC, which is trying to move surgery in Kenya forwards. So based in a low and middle income country, I'm at the receiving end. So I must thank all of you for trying to assist improvement of surgery, uh, obstetrics and anesthesia uh, for us. Uh, in in COSEXA, what we have uh, managed to do is we have to, had to look at what, what is uh, uh, required basically to improve surgery. It was a college of surgeons, so we were focusing on surgery. Uh, to put it in brief terms, we have 740 trainees at the present moment, training in 19 countries in East, Central and Southern Africa. So we have 14 member countries in COSEXA and uh, we have other satellite countries like in West Africa, in uh, Southern Africa where they have become uh, accredited by the COSEXA board for training surgeons. So we have 740 trainees. And having stepping down, have stepped down from COSEXA last year, uh, we realized that uh, we, need, we need plans and NSOAP is a, is, a, is a very good step forward. But the thing that we realized in Kenya was we need to tie it down and work together with the Ministry of Health plans, whichever they are. So there are countries where there are health plans and we need to merge them together. That's the first thing we realized. The second thing we realized is that the Ministry of Health must be uh, approachable from what you are requesting for, all right? And in Kenya government, the Kenya government was very uh, conducive to listening to us. And in 2015, when I was the Secretary General of COSEXA, uh, together with the team, uh, the Ministry of Health bought uh, surgical equipment for 90 hospitals, most of them based in the rural areas. And this has been a great impetus for us to move surgery forwards. So this was the famous MES program, which was the managed equipment and serviced program uh, in partnership with GE, which means that GE would service this equipment over the coming years because we realized that uh, servicing of the equipment is one of the key factors. We buy lots of equipment and then if the fuse blows, okay, off late we have moved on, but in the past if a fuse blew, nobody know, knew how to sort of get the equipment going. And it, 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 it sort of collected as junk. And as, as Lan said, co-commissioner, having attended uh, Sierra Leone and the meetings in Bellagio in London. One of the famous, uh, Nobuji Troy coined this term, junk for Jesus, for low and middle income countries. You know, so to avoid that, we have a service program now uh, in which 11 ICUs were equipped. And uh, lo and behold, these ICUs have come so useful at the present moment uh, in uh, the COVID era. But I think coming back to uh, NSOPs, uh, leadership at the Ministry of Health, uh, the people who make decisions uh, and their views have to be molded towards NSOP. Because realistically speaking, after having worked in this area for some time, you know, there are lots of issues that the ministries have. Immunization is one of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, at a recent meeting, we realized that because of immunizations, and because of cross infections with other coronaviruses that were there in the past, we were not immunized against coronavirus, but we were immunized against other uh, viruses. 
Uh, the mortality in Africa may be low. There is an NCBI paper at the present moment looking into this, and there may be some of these benefits there. Uh, they have problems with trauma at the present moment, all right? And we have to look at health overall, uh, keeping our focus on surgery, uh, obstetrics, gynecology, and anesthesia in, the, in this program. But they have their own agendas, uh, which, which may be equally important. So all this has to be tied in uh, uh, at the thing. The other eye-opener for us was we did a surgical capacity study in Kenya. And Kenya, I believe, after having worked in these 19 African countries, traveled around and seen them, is one of the better placed countries uh, as compared to Rwanda, Mozambique, uh, Malawi, and such places. Rwanda is progressing very well of late. But in Kenya, when we did the surgical capacity study, we found that 80% of the district hospitals do not have a full-time surgeon. 80% do not have a full-time OBGYN, and 90% do not have a full-time anesthetist. So if we went to the Ministry of Health and said, we need to look at the district hospital, I think our target was wrong, okay? So with this NSOAP, we need to focus on what is the level of NSOAP care available, and the capital cities may be all right. Should we go to the second biggest city, the third or fourth biggest city and start there? Because at the Landsat Commission, our focus was a district hospital. And right. we may be shooting the wrong target at the district hospital. So those were the things that we, we found. And with COSEX, our emphasis is to train surgeons in the rural areas. And we have realized that if you train in the rural areas, they're likely to work in the rural areas. So those are the important things that we have realized at the present moment. And uh, we now have fellows of COSEXA who trained about 10 years ago, have worked for five years and are now trainers for other COSEXA trainees at three hospitals uh, in Kenya on their own. These are the, the rural of the rural areas I'm talking about. And most of the other 20 hospitals, we have COSEXA fellows who are now the trainers. So I think this is my contribution and thank you very much for the honor and opportunity to, to share this with you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Prof. So we can see that uh, NSOAP is being utilized or at least is, is serving as an aspirational goal for galvanizing care in remote communities, for uh, unpacking it to help support things like the MES program and managing uh, equipment service program in Kenya and across uh, many uh, specialties and, and uh, surgical services. But let's talk a little bit more about health workforce support and how NSOAP can be a tool to galvanize health workforce support and also to go to the other side of the continent and touch base a little bit on what's happening within the Economic Coalition of West African States, which is professionally galvanized for surgeons and anesthesiologists in the West African College of Surgeons by asking Prof. Bisola to talk to us about her experiences, both within the West African College and within Nigeria. Yes, thank you very much, Larry. What the NSOP did for us was to uh, show us what we need to do and after completing the policy, we realized that the workforce in Nigeria was uh, surgeon, anesthetist, and obstetricians, 1.65 per 100,000 population. Now the optimal density really should be 20 by 100,000. We were at 1.65. And so we knew that we had to come up, but we were careful so that uh, we don't um, have a, a, a plan that will not be possible, unreachable. We wanted to achieve our aims. So we had a modest, um, set a modest number at five SAOs per 100,000 population. That is like tripling uh, the number of workforce that we would um, train in the next uh, five years, within a five year period. And um, by doing so, we realized that the key word was training. And we thought, yes, surgical care for all by trained hands. So that's, mm -hmm. we formulated scat hands. We knew we had to change, to train. And uh, we, the, the, the end soap also showed us the areas that will need uh, more 
hands, more surgeons, more obstetricians, uh, a, a trauma specialist, and um, anesthesiologist. And we realized that the pattern was we had more people in the urban areas, in the big cities, than in the rural areas. So this plan is redirecting us to think a different way how we can uh, train up uh, and build up capacity for uh, SOTA care, surgery, obstetric trauma, and anesthesia care. NSOAP has directed us. But another thing that it did for us, because while writing the plan, we were inclusive. We had all the professional organizations in surgery, plus nurses and midwives. So we had the Council of Nurses uh, and, and Mid Midwifery of Nigeria working with us. So this diversity made us realize that it's not just about surgeons, obstetricians, and anesthesiologists. We need our perioperative care nurses. We need our intensive care nurses. We need nurses in trauma. We need nurses everywhere. So we had to change our own end soap and called it end soap, like, you know, right. National Surgery Obstetrics Anesthesia and Nursing Plan. Yeah, exactly. And the plan is to train both the SAOs and nurses together and make sure that we work together and increase uh, the numbers. But one interesting thing about Nigeria is we have been working as a team for over 50 years. We have our colleges, the National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria and the Regional College for West Africa, the West African College of Surgeons mm -hmm. at anesthesia in its plan as a faculty right from the beginning, right from the onset. So we train together and it's not such a big problem to have us work together. So one thing is um, while training, we realized also that we need to get uh, the other hospitals where training does not take place. We have to scale them up. So the plan going forward or carrying out the plan, implementing the plan is to make sure that we have newer hospitals uh, accredited for training. We have pioneer champions setting up those hospitals and um, units and departments and then penetrating Nigeria. And we're very lucky that the ENSOP for Nigeria was uh, championed by the Federal Ministry of Health. It's the baby right. of the Federal Ministry of Health. So we worked together right from the beginning. Yes. We have a regional body and we have a national body working together to make sure that we will implement. Now, as part of our plan, uh, we, we, the, the, the federal government wants to train residents at a, 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 a 1,000 new residents every year coming into the system. Okay. And I, I think I'll stop there so that- uh, okay. if, if Well, it's no to... surprise to see uh, an anesthesiology MD talking to us about the, uh, the and making real the issue of task sharing and task shifting, because I think that between the three specialties, uh, anesthesia has historically done the best job of sharing. And I, I think moving forward, it's a great point you bring up within the O of ENSO, when it comes to workforce, we are very much talking about a team, at least a, a team of, of a, a family physician or obstetrician who can actually do the ultimate surgical interventions and a midwife and the labor room nurse. And so I, this is, I think is something that we'll see NSOAP supporting and unpacking in a very real way. And so we know that in Africa, there's been a lot of activity around NSOAP, but uh, we're now going to move over to South Asia and I'm going to ask Prof. Bhagawan Korela to talk to us about where Nepal is with the National Surgery Obstetrics and Anesthesia Plan process and across the arc from creating the policy to fully implementing the policy across the framework of staff stuff and systems. Where are you and yeah. in Nepal and across South Asia as well? Well, thank you, Laurie. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks for organizing this um, very important um, webinar and inviting me to talk. Um, uh, as uh, we've been through this process uh, since a while, 
uh, and the Ministry of Health has actually adopted in principle that we're gonna adopt a National Surgical Obstetric Anesthesia Plan. And we had a plan, as you recall, to hold a uh, writing process uh, workshop uh, in, in Kathmandu. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we had to cancel. So uh, in terms of planning process, I think we're, we're made a decision as a nation to do this. Uh, but in terms of completing this and rolling out uh, into uh, all levels of healthcare system, I think uh, uh, we've done a number of um, bits and pieces things that I'm gonna briefly list uh, what positive, positive things have happened in terms of uh, surgical, obstetric and anesthesia care in this country um, and, and trauma care, so to speak, in addition to general surgery. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think we have the opportunity at the same time, some sort of challenge, uh, how to come up with a coherent national plan in, 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 in you know, surgical and obstetric care and anesthesia service. What has been done recently is a few important things have happened here. Um, first of all, we now have declared that all postgraduate education in this country would be uh, done free of cost because it was paying in the past and all mm -hmm. of them would have to serve two years in the designated hospitals in the country after they graduate doing this postgraduate degree. So that means that we have about a thousand different postgraduate subspecialities and of which probably 40% would be surgical, obstetric or anesthesia topics. So we have a number of graduates coming out every year who are entitled to serve in the communities or wherever they are posted. Uh, provided we have the facility, they could even be posted at the district hospitals and, and, and something like that. Secondly, um, we have um, established our, uh, you know, a uh, number of district hospitals and other centers, primary health centers have uh, so-called comprehensive obstetric care centers, which are supposed to be equipped with equipment and um, human resource to provide the comprehensive obstetric care. Mm -hmm. um, Recently, the government has decided this from this fiscal year that all the emergency and trauma care cannot be left alone just because somebody doesn't have money. So that would be a legal obligation for every hospital to provide care, at least stabilizing of the trauma or the emergency surgical care, regardless of the financial situation of the patient. I think uh, there are other initiatives that uh, you know, the government has taken some of the provincial governments that constitution brought in recently has created seven provinces with the constitutional authorities. They have designated district hospitals is to have complete soap um, uh, and be able to provide five major specialty services. And that is starting now, at least two provinces have started that. So I think we have a uh, number of changes happening. Uh, and um, I think, um, and one more thing is encompassing all of these you know, things, uh, the Ministry of Health has passed the minimum service standards for primary care, secondary care, and tertiary care. So I think all of these uh, are pieces of what we're trying to do, mm -hmm. but I think this is the time that the central government has to work with the provincial governments because they would have their own authority uh, by constitution and a lot of things would have to be done through the provincial governments. And we also have to complete the process of, you know, documenting this, formulating a plan. Uh, it's done in principle. We have to pass it to finalize and they pass it through the cabinet and then kind of roll out in a seamless fashion across the nation. I think this is where we stand. I see a lot of uh, possibilities of getting this, this thing done. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, just a one step further that we have to reassemble again to do this writing process and get through certain legal process. I think this is very important for us. We have substrate to work on, and I think we could um, quickly move forward uh, given the technical collaboration with, with the PGSSC and of course UNITAR. Um, I, and we look forward to doing that in, in near future as soon as um, the COVID situation allows. Um, adding one more uh, sentence about the COVID effect, Mm, yeah. I think um, because of this COVID, the government actually has decided to establish close to 700 health facilities across the nation in each local level government. 
and of which some would be 15 beds, 25 beds. A lot of them would have uh, at least general practitioner who would be able to do uh, provide uh, obstetric care, emergency mm -hmm. obstetric care and basic trauma care. So that's kind of big project in the long run. Uh, and that needs a lot of financial you know, kind of commitment, uh, which we yet need to, which are yet uh, to be finalized. But I think overall, as I said, uh, there are a few things happening and we need to just bring it all together, uh, put it in some sort of policy paper and then roll it over uh, across the nation. Back to you, Julia. Thanks so much. Yes, I think uh, NSOAP uh, is going to serve as one of these cross-sector, unsiloed, generally galvanizing uh, policies that will impact not only surgical services, but will improve non-surgical services as well. And I think I want to thank all the panelists. We, we have a lot to talk about when it comes to COVID's impact on surgical services. But what I like hearing today are the silver lining inside of the general system strengthening uh, for COVID services and how that can actually be of help right now and in the future moving forward. And I'd like to take a minute to recognize Dr. Bikash Dev Kota, who is joined us here. He's the lead of the UNSOAP process for the Nepal Ministry of Health. And if you would please, uh, Dr. Dev Kota, please do say a few words following on to your colleague, Prof. Kurala. Um, Dr. Bikas, are you there? I, I believe you're there. Dr. Bikas is the focal person, as Laurie mentioned, uh, to coordinate this NSOP uh, function. He's a joint secretary at the Ministry of Health and, uh, and, and also the division head for uh, monitoring and quality control uh, on the, all the health facilities of Nepal. I think he's the right person to be in the focus of this. And he's been keen you know, on organizing this in, in Nepal and he's been instrumental to pass it at the ministry level um, as, as a policy that needs to be worked up and implemented. Uh, he may not be able to uh, sign in as a our panelist or he may not have done that, but I would like to recognize him and thank him for being together with us, probably listening. And I'm sure he would be taking this up uh, very soon back in the ministry uh, and we will get together uh, shortly on writing this uh, answer. Thank you. Yes, if the team could find out if Dr. Bikash can actually join us or not, let me know in a minute if that's true. In the meantime, I would like to back up a little bit. You know, we have professional regional colleges and we have uh, even uh, transcontinental collaborations between Africa and Asia regarding development of NSOAP and unpacking NSOAP into actual actionable protocols for work at the facility level. But we also have large non-governmental organizations who have played a key role in supporting and strengthening and, and raising the call to action around the need to support surgical services across the community and across the lifespan. And so I'd like to call on Kate, please, to talk to us about Operation Smile's role that it has played in the countries and facilities where it's working in transforming NSOAP policy into action. And then to back it up a little bit, the role that, uh, that Operation Smile has played in actually supporting the formulation of NSOAP. Kate. I'd say the most important thing is that the government, the local government always has to be in the driver's seat. They always have to have ownership over the development and the implementation of, of the NSOAP. And you know, each country is gonna have a very different appearance. We know many countries, for example, Malawi, um, really partner with FBOs, faith-based organizations, which actually you know, run many of the, the district level hospitals, uh, whereas um, you know, many countries are, are more private sector um, oriented. So, so each implementation is going to, to look a little bit differently. But I think that what global NGOs such as Operation Smile bring um, is technical expertise and is partnership and relationships. So you know, Operation Smile has a pool of over 6,000 volunteers all over the world. And actually the majority of our volunteers now are in low and middle income countries. Um, so it's an incredible resource. And I like to say that, that Operation Smile actually has the world's largest uh, faculty uh, for surgical care. Because we bring in so many people with such incredible skill set. 
And also we bring in relationships, uh, for example, um, relationships with Johnson & Johnson, you know, Stryker, so manufacturers of some of the essential equipment um, that's necessary. You know, it can be very difficult for small countries to maintain these relationships, maximize uh, this type of relationships. Some also groups like Operation Smile can build economies of scale um, right. and, and disseminate information. You know, it, it's, it's one, it's a small thing when one country does something, but when you work with 30 countries to achieve something, you, you really can do it much more, more cost effectively. And just to give a, you know, example from an education point of view, one thing that, that's very necessary is to uh, create public goods. So for example, um, you know, free open source curricula that anyone can use to, to educate PACU nurses or ICU nurses or, or anesthesia nurses. Um, uh, free open source uh, plans for running surgical residencies or running surgical fellowships. It's quite interesting when I was speaking to the head of the first plastic surgery residency in, in Rwanda, which Operation Small helped establish along with some other partners. I asked him what was the most difficult part of starting the residency, and he said the business plan. Uh, so the ability to, to, you know, because he's a surgeon, he knows how to operate. He just graduated from uh, his residency in France. He, you know, he knows about, you know, how to teach, um, but he'd never done a business plan before. Right. And ability to get templates of business plans, you know, templates of admission systems, you know, financing systems for residencies and, and other programs. That's the type of thing that, that we can do as an NGO to really lower the cost of entry uh, for a lot of the NSOAP implementation. Yeah. I like the point you make about economies of scale, but you also just brought up uh, something that Operation Smile has been doing around uh, economies of scope, that you help support the formulation of a plastic surgery division. And uh, for instance, in the work that I was doing previously, uh, managing a fistula project, we also use that to support other issues that affect women's pelvic floor in the area of urogynecology and general gynecology. And so I think NGOs play a key role at multiple levels in, in, in terms of engaging and accelerating economies. Um, I want to throw something out there to the speakers. We, we, uh, we all know that moving forward as NSOAP gets galvanized and we, we begin to unpack it more and more into policy and protocols that support excellent standards of care. What do you think the role will be of civil society organizations in terms of doing community outreach? I know Kate's shaking her head. I know that Operation Smile does a lot of community outreach, all NGOs do. And in OBGYN, of which I believe I'm the only representative on the panel, there's a lot of community outreach for family planning and for antenatal care and for uh, facility-based delivery and, and educating the public. And so we're very familiar working with faith-based organizations and civil society or organizations that the communities trust. So Kate, I'm gonna start with you and then work backwards. Uh, what does Operation Smile do around civil society organization engagement and faith? Well, I think uh, civil society is uh, essential for patient education and for patient finding. Uh, this is a particular concern with, with cleft and also other plastic surgery issues like burn contractures, where people might not be aware these are surgically correctable or that they're easily surg surgically correctable. Um, and it's difficult for a global, uh, global organization you know, to have its relationships down to that last mile. So we need to have relationships with civil society that are established in country and you know, permanently will be in country who can do that type of patient education you know, in the local language, explain it cultural context. You know, another challenge that we have with cleft is the stigma against cleft. Some people think a woman gives uh, uh, birth to a cleft child because she did something wrong and there's a stigma yeah. involved. Uh, and yes. so that, that cultural competence that the CSOs have is really quite critical. Wonderful. All right, I would like to give Ruben Ayala a, an opportunity also to talk to us about the role that G4 Alliance has played, such a crucial and, and foundational role in uh, galvanizing the ENSOAP community. And go ahead, Ruben, and expand and talk about G4's lens and uh, pr uh, practices around engaging faith-based leaders and civil society organizations for community outreach. Uh, thank you, Laurie. And I'll, I'll, I'll start by saying that um, having spent close to 30 years in, 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 in humanitarian work around surgery, 
uh, I'm, I'm very proud of, of, of what has been accomplished, what I've seen accomplished uh, throughout the years. Uh, certainly in my, in my engagement with Operation Smile, where I spent the vast majority of my time, uh, was I, as, I, as I was given the opportunity to, to be part of the G4, um, I, I found real joy on the concept and the, just the awareness that, that as someone who's seeking to offer some level of, of activity and support towards the health of others, either as, a member, as an individual or as a member of an organization, we were not alone. Uh, so, so the G4 um, ha has really become um, a, a common place where different organizations that have, different, that have had different focus in the past have come together with a unified approach um, towards the expansion of safe surgery. You know, and mm -hmm. people talk about the importance of advocacy and, and, it, and, and how that connects to, to the actual work. Um, for those of us who've been in the implementation side and have seen decade after decade, other priorities uh, be taken on by leaders, leaders of different countries, you know, it, it's almost like you've, you feel a sense that, that, you've, that the people that you see have this vast need are being forgotten. So coming together with over 60 uh, organizations that represent different uh, areas of, of expertise um, gives us an opportunity to, to, to really put on the map and, and use the, the resources of, and knowledge of every organization and partners outside of the four alliance you know, right, to, right. To, to place that emphasis on how important it is, how critical, how critical it is for the health of our populations uh, to have access to safe surgical obstetric trauma and anesthesia care. Uh, I think we're at a moment of, of real evolution. Uh, it, 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 I, I celebrate, for instance, recently there's, there's been a couple of pieces by John Dutton, uh, Desmond Jumba, and Libby Bunker, and Elroy Sydney, uh, talking about the transformation of organizations that they focus uh, mainly on, on, on NGOs, but this is true for all of us who, who are even members of an, an alliance like the G4. Um, specific concepts, you know, partnering with policymakers as the key uh, step towards um, universal coverage, um, mm -hmm. making sure that the partnerships are equitable, that, that, that we're not only equipping people with worker, uh, the health workers with knowledge and, uh, and training, but we, we are looking to decrease dependency, that we, that we look at a broad approach. Many of us within an al the alliance are looking, how do we take care of more patients today? How do we take care of more patients tomorrow? Uh, but many of us might not have been looking more broadly and the investments in, in the entire surgical systems that are required. So you know, after 20, 30 years, you, you're very pleased to have seen thousands and thousands of patients being care, taken care of, but today we still see the same challenge happening over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, and, but the coll collaboration that has been fostered uh, within organizations of, uh, of the G4 Alliance and, and our desire to reach out and partner with others uh, in this space, uh, I believe is, is, is a real source of joy and opportunity um, because it allows for us to start collaborating in a more transparent manner get rid of competition, which gets which, which really stifles results uh, and, and empowerment um, and start to collaborate. You know, when Prof. Lala was talking about um, the, the experience of him going to Dubai to the workshop that was organized by, by Harvard's PGSSC, then continuing with, um, with uh, the work uh, with organizations like Jepago uh, and the National Surgical Plan, then us with Operation Small, for instance, joining in, um, with, with many other organizations uh, uh, that are now partnering to look into the implementation, it really is a result of, of, of many different players having that same mantra of how do we work together with the leaders of a country? How do we uh, approach care in, in a way that is, that is appropriate? How do we advocate for that care so that, and, and learn from, 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 from our experience so that it gets replicated throughout um, the different regions? Um, and, and how do we bring um, funders that acknowledge, you know, one of, one of the, the moments of pride for me has been really working with, for instance, UBS Optimus Foundations, which has been so open to us saying, this isn't really working, might we try a different approach? So donors that are very aware that the ultimate goal is not the, the priorities that the donor itself sets, but the priorities that are set by the, by the country um, uh, as, as, as a way forward. Um, so members of the G4 Alliance will continue to advocate, will continue to, to, to work together, to collaborate, to, to try to coordinate. Um, there are real opportunities in increasing the effectiveness of how we're using our resources, our knowledge, our people, 
um, to, to drive change um, and, and, and make sure that there's a future for patients with surgical conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. Um, I'd like to also talk more about civil society uh, organization work by asking Bisala to come back in and talk to us about the role of civil society and faith-based leaders in reaching communities in Nigeria. One of the most robust experiences I've ever had with community outreach was in Nigeria, where there are so many faith-based leaders and local organizations that are literally out there going door to door to raise awareness and help patients and families get the care they need. Bisola. Yeah, thank you very much. I'd like to follow up on what Ruben said by saying teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> and um, concerning reaching out to the community, sometimes we get the community to come to the hospital and we have a week of outreach, yeah. five days of essential surgery, cleft lip repair, uh, cleft palate repair, you know, hanyorafis. And uh, we have this during a week in teaching hospitals. It's common in almost all the teaching hospitals in Nigeria when we dedicate a week to bring the community in. Now, what does it do? It gives safety, it gives access, and it increases the numbers, the volume of surgeries that we need to do. Apart from that, it also helps skills. So we get to do uh, a critical number of cases during that week that helps our skills. On the flip side of it is when the group, the surgeons and the uh, uh, anesthetist, uh, the, the perioperative team goes into the community for a period. And this is uh, very common in Nigeria, like you said, uh, Laurie, uh, go to a community for a period. It's supported by the community leaders, by the chief in the community. All the stakeholders are involved. Donors are involved. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, funding. Uh, sometimes uh, the, the, the mission is supported by the church. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's supported by the NGOs, depending on, on the area you come from. And this is quite also, uh, well, quite popular, especially in the North, you have people reaching out to communities and setting up uh, mobile theaters, mobile hospitals, and doing essential operations during that period. Mm -hmm. So it helps as well to raise uh, awareness and um, to, 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 to make sure that you know, people get the necessary um, uh, care, surgical care and anesthesia care that they need. It's a really nice time because it's, it's not just in Nigeria. We've had cases where, uh, during, especially during the conferences, uh, the West African College of Surgeons or the mm -hmm. National Postgraduate uh, College, post, post College in Nigeria, you know, during their, uh, um, their conferences, congresses, before the Congress, the main Congress, a conference starts, they have an outreach mm -hmm. in that community. So it's a way of um, reaching out, a way of giving back to the community, a way of sharing skills, a quick way of developing skills, learning from one another. And uh, this really helps. That uh, has been my experience in Nigeria. It's, it, it's wonderful. And I'll also like to say here that, um, you know, in Nigeria, we have the tertiary institutions, we have the general hospitals, we have a uh, um, um, community health post, you know, things like that. And it's, so when you work together like that, it's like we have a bridge between all the members of the workforce in those areas coming together and working together. Right. And there is a component of rural uh, practice in our curriculum as well. So it's not just enough to stay in the ivory towers. Yes. The, the, the tertiary hospitals, but then you have to go to some rural hospitals and render service. So this is um, how uh, it's been in most countries in West Africa. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'd like to uh, take a moment to, to share a lesson learned within the maternal newborn community that I think NSOAP and the safe surgery community in general is already structurally set up to avoid. And that is that you really, you need community outreach and you will end up working with faith-based and civil society uh, leaders in order to reach those communities, educate them and help them get the care they need. 
but first you have to make sure that you're driving them in for care at facilities that are ready to take care of them and uh, across uh, large parts of the world, enthusiastic, but let's say suboptimally timed efforts to do community outreach for maternal, maternity services have ended up backfiring in a large way. Um, patients and communities know when a facility is providing quality services and they will come uh, and they'll appreciate the help of outreach. But if they get there and the services are not up to task, then you end up making your job much more difficult. And so I'd like to shift lens now uh, towards our immediate future. We have about 10, 15 minutes left for our panelists. Quick lightning rounds. We are looking at 2030. It is ever, it is ever closer in, in front of us. And we have uh, along with it, the challenge of COVID. Quickly, uh, Emmanuel and then Pankaj, I'm going to ask you to give the SADC and EXA region lens on where are we with NSOAP and how are we going to successfully arrive at 2030? Emmanuel? Um, thank you so much. So for us in SADC, we've got countries recommitted to developing NSOAP through two resolutions in 2018 and 2019. Uh, some of our countries have already developed the ENSOP to completion. They're moving into implementation, while many others are in the process of formulation of the ENSOP at different stages. Mm -hmm. uh, as regards the challenges we're facing with the development of the policy in different countries, we'll try to use another approach uh, because we've realized that creating a national policy might be challenging. So we'll look at options of developing, for example, a provisional surgical obstetric anesthesia plan or indeed a district surgical obstetric anesthesia plan. If we decentralize the policy in its development and also uh, work with the stakeholders at that level, we feel that we could it would be easier because we are looking at a smaller group. Uh, there will be more at commitment to actually implementing it by that district. And then maybe if this is implemented, this can also feed back uh, into the national policy to ensure that the evidence is actually there. And then this can be scaled up. We've seen this work in many other programs that have been tried or piloted with a small local policy that generates the evidence once implemented and then it's scaled up. So we will try to be innovative even in the creation of the policy where we are struggling in different countries. We will try to use that option to see if we can start with the district and then go up because we have champions at the district and we may have stronger commitment at the district than at national level. And so we could try that in some countries. Uh, as regards where the policy has already been developed at national level, again, like I said earlier, we will really strongly look at uh, the entry points to see, you know, using trauma, using maternal child health, uh, using NCDs, specific entry points that could, we could use to try and impact and show the impact of policy. And then generally in SADAC, we are also developing the CERIC strategy. We have created a, co a regional collaboration center. We have a technical experts working group uh, with many representatives and we want all the focal points with focal points in each SADAC country. We meet every two weeks. And so this is a strong platform where we continue to exchange views, uh, exchange expertise, ex uh, share lessons that we're learning and also mobilize partnerships uh, through that platform. And we're very proud to say that the Global Surgery Foundation, the PGSSC, uh, Operation Smile, all these are partners that we have on this platform and we're working with them and we hope that they can also input this strategy so that the regional strategy also provides uh, a framework through which there could be peer review among countries and also exchange of technical skills because we may lack these in specific countries. That's where we are and uh, our future is bright. We have survived through the COVID and we're still working and I'm sure we'll come back with very positive results. Plus, I want to add that we also are developing a way of institutional the whole surgical development process by having an annual surgery report of some sort at country level. This report, we think that will keep the focus on surgical health services. And also these reports could be standardized so that we can compare what's happening in the different countries. And these reports will also be useful in reporting back to WHO. As you know, in uh, decision 7022, uh, the countries have to report every two years on the progress they are making in implementation of the original resolution in 2015. And the next report is coming up this year. So we need to mobilize our countries and ensure that this does not drop off the WHO um, radar. Uh, and ensure that we can stay tracking everything we're doing. So that's what that's where we are in SEDAC and that's how we seem to be going forward. 
Wonderful. So meeting and reporting and using that reporting up and down the scale. Prof. Johnny, please talk to us about COSEX's vision for where we will be in 2030 with regards to NSOAP implementation. Uh, I was excited to hear so much energy coming out from my friend Emmanuel, you know, and I don't want to sound pessimistic, but uh, Kenya had just been given six months by the Paris Club to delay its loan repayments uh, that the money that Kenya has borrowed for infrastructure and all these developments. I believe Zambia is losing its minds slowly to the big donor. Kenya may be losing its port. And I don't want to be pessimistic, but let's face reality here. COVID has hit the finances in such a way that health and all the work that we are involving is really going to take a big hit. Uh, the plan for COSEXA, as I presented as a president, was to train 5,800 surgeons in these 19 countries. I think we will be able to train something like 60% of them. We are tracked in Kenya. Uh, we, we took 150 surgeons over the last year in training over the three years. All right, over the last three years, there are 150 surgeons. We took 50, 50 some ballpark figures, okay? So we have about 200, 220 surgeons training in Kenya, mostly 70% of these in the rural hospitals. Uh, but I have a meeting with the Ministry of Health, the Director of Clinical Services and his team tomorrow at 9.45. We, we are working on this plan that we have developed for Kenya. We are not looking at the district hospitals at the present moment. We have 50, uh, 250 district hospitals in Kenya. And if I present the plan uh, to, to the Ministry of Health for the 250 district hospitals to have NSOP at those district hospitals, the ministry will have no money left. So to look at all the things, and we're looking at the intermediate hospitals now. So district hospitals, intermediate hospitals, regional hospitals, and national referral hospitals. That's our plan at the present moment. We are taking it step by step, you know, but the dollar is going to disappear in most areas and health, to be very honest with you, has not been the priority of African countries. And that is why we are where we are. So I'm very thankful to all of you, and especially Ruben, my friends there, Advocacy, 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 advocating for health, advocating for surgery. Uh, Ruben remembers very well that 10 years ago, we distributed a folder to each health minister at the health minister's conference in EXA. And that has resulted in what we are seeing in Zambia, where there were proactives, uh, health minister Kasonde, and we were in, in, in uh, Geneva together. And he took it up straight away and said, this looks, so it's advocacy, 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 but the dollars are going to dwindle. That's my fear. And we need to innovate, we need to innovate. We've started a lot of our surgeries in, 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 in the hospitals with uh, local anesthesia and with the Volant method advocated by Donald Nellon from Canada, who's the president of the Hand Surgery Society of the American College of Surgeons, wide awake, local anesthesia, no tourniquet hand surgery. So these myths that we have created that if there's a hand trauma, you need to go to the main operating theater and it costs you an arm and a leg to operate that patient have to be moved away from. And we need to innovate. We need to find uh, more uh, economical ways of treating these patients with similar outcomes. So we are looking at hernias being operated under local anesthesia and with, with, with meshes which are different uh, from what we have at the present moment. We have gone into the neglected surgical disease program or neglected surgical conditions program in a county. We've eradicated all the cataracts, all the clefts, and uh, fistulas, we're looking at hernias now under local anesthesia, but we'll need to innovate, innovate, innovate with lesser and lesser funding will available. I, I'm, I'm greatly uh, you know, encouraged by Emmanuel's uh, excitement and energy there. Emmanuel, we need to work together and get this thing sorted out. So thank you, everybody. With those few words, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Pankaj. So we are going to enter an era of steep innovation in order to successfully arrive at 2030 when it comes to surgical services. I think we can all agree on that. I'd now like to ask our colleagues who are working in countries that are a little earlier in the process. Prof. Kerala in Nepal and Prof. Lala in Madagascar. Prof. Lala, we will begin with you. Please uh, share with us where you think you might be in 2030 with regards to NSOAP and what sort of collaborations you might ask from the safe surgery community in order to accelerate your process. Prof Lala. 
You you need to unmute again. Yeah, there you go. Yes. Okay. No, not for the, the next uh, years. We we begin in the to to give training in the region, and with Operation Smell, we 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 we, we begin to 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 give a new approach, proximity approach, to give training on the region, as Emmanuel said before. We need to go there to the uh, rural district uh, areas and to give training there with uh, professor, uh, experts from the, the capital, surgeon, anesthesiologist, and uh, obstetrician. We go to the region and give their training. We begin in the Antira Bay, and our uh, aim is to, to, to continue to go to the region and to 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 practice to 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 practice and swap in the region. Thank you. Thanks very much, Prof Lala, and Prof Karala yep. from Nepal uh, and and uh, South Asia, uh, perhaps indirectly representing the region. Uh, where do you think Nepal will be by 2030, and what sort of collaborations might you hope for from the community? Well, I think that's, uh, um, that's something that we could uh, really look forward to. And I hope uh, in next several years, we would have a um, surgical obstetric anesthesia plan uh, formulated and uh, probably implemented, uh, at least in most parts of our um, healthcare system. And I think I like the idea uh, uh, that Emmanuel brought up that sometimes it may not go from top to bottom everywhere. Some provinces might be ahead of uh, the others. And I think that probably is reality here. Some of the provinces will take it up uh, mm -hmm. as part of their um, you know, healthcare plan. Um, so I, I see, look at this as uh, with a great deal of optimism and hopefully uh, working together with uh, the surgical um, you know, diaspora and with uh, the group that we're working on right now with you guys, the quality improvement processes will also be put in place as we expand in the access um, and the availability of the care. I think that's uh, extremely important uh, not to cause harm uh, while trying to expand the services across the nation. I'm, I'm pretty hopeful that within the next uh, few years we'll have a plan in place. Thanks very much. So I'd now like to come back to Operation Smile as a global non-governmental organization, very active in the safe surgery community. Quickly, where does Operation Smile expect to be by 2030 in terms of accelerating uh, granular activities for NSOAP and strengthening NSOAP in the countries where you're working? Kate. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, well, in the next uh, few years, uh, Operation Small will enter its next 40 uh, years of, uh, of operation. And so uh, we'll be doing those initiatives, so, uh, which I mentioned, uh, the 40 for 40, which is looking at improving surgery at the district hospital level. And we'll be doing that throughout the, the six health system building blocks. So looking at service delivery, looking at health workforce, looking at information and data use, looking at uh, uh, medications and, and supplies, leadership and governance, financing, really looking at that whole spectrum of the health system as it occurs at the district hospital level. We also have a um, initiative looking at, um, at women in surgery and women's surgical teams and making sure that uh, women have access to careers in, in surgery, whether it's the physician careers or the nursing and, and other careers. Uh, and so um, and as I mentioned, the University Without Walls, we are going to be expanding that to make sure that we can train at that local level. I, I agree completely with what Prof. Johnny says about the need to train as locally as possible, recruiting and training people locally. All that's the best way to retain people at that level. Thanks very much. And I'm going to turn it over now to Jeff Ibbotson uh, in order to allow UNITAR or ask UNITAR for some summary statements. Jeff. Well, thanks very much, Laurie. This has been a, a fantastic session and what a great way to finish off this series. And I just wanted to highlight some of the uh, topics that all of you highlighted. Um, and you know, this, this uh, session was particularly important for what are the pragmatic steps? What do we do next? We go into work on Monday morning, what do we do? 
And so I've just been jotting down a few of the points that I've taken away from. I just want to highlight some of them. Number one, locally driven. End soaps and the whole process must be locally driven. And on top of that, as we've heard from Professor Lala and, and uh, Dr. Jani, is that the Ministry of Health has to have ownership of this. Otherwise, it won't move forward very well. And there's been some discussion in the Q&A about this as well. Partnerships, very important. Ruben and Kate, you've highlighted these points and partnerships are very important. And to go beyond the international partnerships, the teamwork partnerships that we have locally. Um, one of the questions that came up was about nurses and Lori, you've brought up the point about obstetrics and all the different aspects of surgical care. And for any of us who've actually been a surgeon in the operating room, you know you can't do your work without anesthesia, without good nursing, without somebody who's going to clean the equipment and make sure your facility is well taken care of. We're talking about an entire team. And so this is very, very important to maintain that concept that this is a team effort. It's not about a surgeon. It's not about an anesthetist or an anesthesia nurse. It's about the whole team. And so I really want to emphasize that. The other thing that came out in the discussion is the different levels of care. You know, it's not about the tertiary care surgical services. It's not even about district level. It goes right down to the primary care level where, you know, that's where the patient is often first identified and referred, or you can do simple procedures like a drainage of an abscess. So we need to think at all levels as well. So, and Laura, you brought up several times, and this was discussed by many of the speakers about uh, further teamwork in civil society and faith-based leadership, getting out there to the community. If we don't get everybody involved, we're not gonna get the attention of the government. And, and Dr. Jana, you were mentioning about this huge challenge we have with COVID right now. I, I actually, I would say that despite the pessimism of the world during this pandemic, we have an opportunity to show that without good health, your economy is not gonna work very well. And surgical care serves as the cornerstone foundation for a resilient, sustainable healthcare system. And so we need to advocate and make sure that message is getting out there because it's right. The financing is going to be very difficult, although I'm always interested to see how certain organizations and industries actually benefited from the pandemic and are now wealthier. But in terms of governments, we need to really um, uh, push this, uh, this agenda that a good, healthy community uh, will do better economically. So let's get that message out there. So those were, the those were the little points that I had jotted down for this one. And I just wanted to do a quick wrap up, if I may, for the whole series as a reminder. We had started with the launch of the, the NSOAP manual. And Julia, if you can, uh, can you put the link into the chat for where you can go to download that manual? Just once again, it's on the GSF website, but you know it, we've had a tremendous response on this series. Uh, after the launch back in September, within a couple of hours of that webinar, the, the ENSOAP manual was downloaded over 200 times uh, from all spectrums of care, uh, surgeons, uh, obstetricians, uh, anesthesia, government, administration. It, it was a wonderful response. So we want to keep this momentum moving forward. Uh, the second webinar was the first-hand experience of developing an NSOAP. And this was a, a, a great discussion having uh, Zambia, Pakistan, Nigeria, and Tanzania, and both Emmanuel and Bazola were at that one. So thank you again. The third one was integrating NSOAPs into the national health strategies. We must remember this is not a standalone process. This must be integrated within the overall strategy for the Ministry of Health. We then went on in November for the donor's perspective for funding the implementation. And then the fifth one was the perspective of the ministries of health. And we were honored to have several ministers of health involved with that one. And then a very lively discussion occurred with the role of NGOs, academic institutions, professional associations, and the non-state actors. And if you had joined that discussion, you'll remember 
how lively it was that, you know, we got to remember nursing, like in Nigeria, we have to remember obstetrics, we have to remember pediatrics, trauma. And there was a clear message that came through and, and all of these uh, webinars are online and you can go back and watch them. But the message that came through was that there's a need for this process to be driven locally. And it sort of came into this whole discussion about decolonization of global health. So uh, it, after that one, we had a call for, let's have a few sequels on that discussion. And so we'd be happy to carry on those discussion and, and few, uh, future webinars. Um, so what I'd like to do now, is, before I say a few thank yous, I wanna just speak to the participants. I want you to, to reach out to your local people and to us, and I would love to continue the momentum of this great series with future webinars. So I'd love to hear your perspectives, what your questions are, because at the end of the day, it's you who are, are treating the patients on the front line, and that's what's important for us. So uh, please reach out to us through our, our website and any of the partners to uh, get your questions in. And I'll, uh, before the thank yous, I'll just mention that we do want to uh, write this whole series up into a proceedings that will be published. And so having some of those questions and having that feedback will be important for, for uh, fulfill, you know, filling out those gaps in, in, in the written part of the, the uh, proceedings. So, once again, I'd like to thank all of the panelists today. It was a wonderful discussion. Thank you, Laurie, for a great job at moderating. And I just want to, on behalf of the Global Surgery Foundation and UNITAR, I just want to say a special thanks to the PGSSC for partnering with us on this uh, and all of the authors for the manual. There were over 50 authors that contributed to the manual and it was a wonderful job. So we're very honored to be able to work with all of them on this. And I'd also like to at this time uh, give a special thanks to Julia who you see on the line and Rabab who helped coordinate this uh, series with the planning committee who included Scott Corlew and Key Park and Paul Trush and, and several others on the planning committee. I just wanna give a special thank you be for all of those people, because without the hard work behind the scenes, this would not have happened. I'd also like to say thank you to all the partners. Some are who are with us today, the G4 and Operation Smile, but there were many other partners involved with the, uh, the previous sessions. And, and without the partners, again, it goes back to partnerships. Uh, we're stronger together, and, and we, uh, we really appreciate that from the GSF Unitar side. And again, I'd like to especially thank the participants, especially those of you who are on the front lines, because this is why we do this work, really. It's to, to put the proper tools into your hands to treat your patients. And without this, um, you know, we wouldn't be uh, having the proper focus. So I really wanna thank all of the participants, those of you who are in the trenches on the front lines uh, for doing what you're doing. And uh, many of us have been there and realize what it's like. And uh, we wanna just commend you for the wonderful work that you're doing. So I uh, just wanna say thank you once again. And on behalf of the United Nations Institute for Training and Research and the Global Surgery Foundation, we look forward to future webinars. Uh, please send in your comments and uh, thank you once again. Keep safe and have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jim. Bye. Thank you. Thank you to all. You Have a good evening. Bye. Keep safe. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.